there's a story, a true story I'd like to start with, because I want to talk about the goodness of God. And uh, many years ago, there was a couple called Von and Joanne Leatherer, and at the very young age of one, Von was diagnosed with haemophilia, which is a bleeder's disease. His blood lacked the substance necessary to co coagulate and uh, thus threatening his life each time he suffered a minor injury. In those days, of course, there was very little treatment for the disease, which meant he was not expected to live beyond childhood. But his father, his minister, his mother, his friends, his church, they all prayed, believing God, for a miracle. But no miracle occurred. However, because of prayer, he received 400 pints of blood transfused into his body by the end of his adolescent years, which enabled him to continue to live. Joanne, a childhood sweetheart, stood by his side and knowing the uncertainty of the future, still married Vaughn. He was 22, she was 19. And several years later, while carrying the second child, she became seriously ill with Hodgkinson's disease, a type of cancer that attacks the lymph glands and fatal in that day. She could not have the limited treatment available because of her pregnancy. And some people, the same people prayed and they all took hold of God and as a result, a miracle occurred and after clinical tests, she was cancer free. Now, here's a scenario. Same family, lovely, dedicated Christians. One person doesn't get a miracle, the other one does. Does God make sense? He doesn't. Did you know that? When I first was diagnosed with cancer, it was called Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's, but then they changed it several weeks later after they got a test back from America to say that I had a very aggressive um, lymphoma and which was called triple hit lymphoma. And of course, they virtually gave me two years to live. But anyway, here's a case where God doesn't make sense and yet God's supposed to be a good God. He heals one and not the other. Do you ever wonder why? And of course, I, talk, I was talking to a friend of mine at church, and I just happened to say to him one day, God's a good God. And he was, his response to me I, took me by surprise, because he said, well, if God is a good God, he would let me have a heart attack and I would go to heaven. I was absolutely astounded. Um, but I didn't know, and of course I found out later that, you know, 12 months ago that he lost his wife, and of course he'd been grieving, and he was very lonely, and so naturally this is the way he felt. Well, how do you make sense of God when God doesn't answer prayer? And yet, on the other hand, he does answer prayer. When I first was diagnosed and, and I asked the Lord to heal me, the heavens were as brass. I felt like my prayers were just bouncing back, bouncing against the walls. Nothing was happening. But, you know, I've always believed that God is good. Always. But there is sometimes a hidden controversy within the Christian believer trying to handle and grapple with the questions why, why things, bad things happen to people, why trials and difficulties and sickness I mean, I, I thought, you know, after 50 years of serving the Lord and uh, I've been in good health and strength, no medication whatsoever over the years, and, um, and I thought the protection of the Lord was around about me and then bang, I get diagnosed with cancer. And I couldn't even say the word cancer for two, year, for two weeks until I knew the reality that I had to face. It's an interesting scenario, and this hidden controversy, people have to learn how to handle the fact that we do go through trials. 
and difficulties. And some of those trials are sickness and disease, some mental disease. And others, of course, they're, they're a variation of the trials that, that we go through. And we have to try and, and live the Christian life and, and, and be able to comprehend the fact and believe that God is a good God. He is, because he's God. But how does it all work? I want you to take you to my text, which is Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, which says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust him. Hallelujah. And again, it's reconfirmed in Psalm 86, verse 5, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon him. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? So what do you do when you have these situations? I was ready to go on a mission trip to Madagascar, had me tickets and all. And then I found myself on the 11th of April in hospital with pains in my chest. How do you handle it? It's an interesting scenario. See, the day of trouble, the day of trial, and I call the day of trial or the day of trouble, I call it the bad day, having a bad day. So as believers, yes, we can understand and know the truth of God, that he is a good God, and I'll answer the questions why. Now I want to paraphrase this verse, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. To paraphrase this verse, the Lord, the Lord is always good, and wants to reveal his goodness and nature and blessings, especially to those who put their trust in him who need a place of refuge. I think that's great. Isn't it good? The Lord is good. Do you believe it? Say, the Lord is good. Do you really believe it? Especially if you're going through hard times and you can't hear God. The heavens are as brass. You've been seeking for an answer. No answer comes. No breakthrough comes. And you start to wonder, where is the goodness of God? Come on. We are human beings. We are emotional people. And we do sometimes operate out of our feelings, our sense knowledge. And we have to wonder why. Why, Lord, is this happening? Well, another commentator writes this. He said, the goodness of the Lord is seen in the fact that he is a refuge in distress. Notice that the goodness of the Lord always is manifested when you're going through a difficult time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that interesting? But you don't want anything to happen to you. You, know, you want to live, you know, cloud nine all the time and, and, and enjoy total victory and freedom, well, it's not going to happen. Because if you're a real Christian, you will have a day of trouble. You will have a bad day. Amen? Jesus said that. He said, you, we will have trials and difficulties. All right, so God is good. It's a theological fact. It's his nature. God cannot change. The reality is, is but his active goodness that means his blessings is available to all who have a bad day so God is good but his goodness which is his blessings which is an active participation on God in our circumstances his blessings will come into our lives and of course they are his goodness a manifestation of his goodness in our lives so it's just like the nurses call me the miracle man. So that's a manifestation of his goodness. Amen? And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Scott Nichol. You know why? Because he came and visited me in hospital. He's a good friend and he read the word of God to me. I mean, I was, I was in a desperate position. And yet here he is reading the word and feeding my spirit man. Very good. Good friend. Thanks, Scott. All right, now three imminent questions that often arise in one's mind when a bad day occurs. Did God do this to me? 
The answer is no. God is a good God. He doesn't do bad things. Hear me? God does not do bad things. Second question, why is this happening to me? The answer is he is inviting you to put your trust in him. Because you cannot grow in your faith unless you have a trial. Amen? If you have no trials, you will not grow in your faith. That's fact. They go hand in hand together. Amen? You don't sound too happy. <laughs> Very quiet here. The third question is, where is God in my dilemma? The answer is, he's holding on to you. You know the story about the footprints? Yeah? Well, you know, this one guy, he was walking by the seaside and he was talking to the Lord and he could see the two pairs of footprints in the sand. And, um, and then there was a time period where he could only see one pair and he was thinking to him, where's God? Where's he God? Where's God in my dilemma? And the Lord just whispered to him and he said, I was just carrying you. <laughs> you may not sense it, you may not feel it because we're emotional beings, but God is still a good God and he's still with you. In all the sense of, you know, in all the time period of while I was sick and, um, you know, I knew God was with me. I knew his presence. God would never leave me nor forsake me. And that's true. God is good. What should you know when you're having a bad day? We need to know something. We need to know some scriptures. We need to know what, what God is up to when we're having a bad day. All right? <clears throat> I want to give you a couple of scriptures. Number one. All right, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. Now, these are important scriptures. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. That means not to share. Why? Because he's God. In God's wisdom, there are things in your life that are about to happen or will happen or going to happen that he will not tell you about. He will not answer your question. He'll conceal it. That's because he's God. See, he knows the bigger picture. He understands what's best for you. And how you need to walk day by day with him. And so he, if, he, if he, God shared with you all that he knew about you, you would freak out. And you wouldn't move ahead. If I knew what was ahead of me and what happened in my life, I tell you, I'd be in reverse. Come on. So it's wisdom not to tell you everything. It's wisdom for God to keep things to himself and not tell you. Number two. Isaiah 45, 15. Truly you are a God who hides himself. That's an interesting one. God plays hide and seek. Did you know that? He hides himself from you. In other words, the consciousness of his presence. He's still with you, but you don't know it. He withdraws the consciousness of his presence. So he hides himself from you. Say so in order that you may seek him. Amen. The trouble is when we go through our difficult times, emotionally, we want to bail out. And we want to, you know, when I go through difficult times, I want to be alone. I don't, you know, just leave me alone. And we're like that because we're emotional human beings. So God hides himself but we need to seek him. Ecclesiastes verse 11, verse 5. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Why? Because we're only finite beings. We do not understand what God is doing. Hello? Come on, we have to understand this we have to grapple with this 
Because this is what's going to keep you in your bad day experience. And lastly, in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. His thoughts are always higher. Hallelujah. I'm so glad about that. Amen. So these are scriptures that you need to know and understand in your heart so that when you do go through your bad days or your day of trial or difficulty, then you can sail through it. Now, coming back to Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. We learn that we should, what we should do when having a bad day in order to eliminate any hidden controversy in our lives, any doubt, any fears, and be able to declare with all our hearts that yet God is always good. Three paramount truths in this verse. The Lord is good. The Lord is your stronghold. And the Lord wants your trust. Three things. Three truths. Dynamic truths. Now, if we hold fast and live with these truths, the goodness of God will always be manifest in our lives. Always. Number one, the truth one, Lord is good. That's his nature. You can't change God. It's, you know, we know God is love. And we love that one. We know that God is kind and all that. And so we know God's merciful and forgiving. We know all of that. But God is good. That's his nature. God can't change. But his goodness, of course, is manifested in the form of his blessings. When God says, I'm come to give you life and life more abundant, that's the manifestation of his goodness. Amen? Why? Because he's good. When God says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, and he himself does not tempt anyone. That's a manifestation of his goodness. Why? Because he's good. When God, God is faithful, he will allow you to be tempted above all that you're able to bear. Why? That's a manifestation of his goodness. Because he's good. Numbers, when God says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Behold, I've received the commandment to bless, and he has blessed. I cannot reverse it. That's a manifestation of his goodness. Why? Because he's good. Yes. Truth number one. God is good. And he wants to manifest his goodness. And he is manifesting his goodness in our lives. That's truth number one. Truth number two. The Lord is your stronghold. Stronghold is a place of refuge, which means protection. Figuratively used in Psalm 31, verse 2 and 3, and I quote, Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Now we read that often in the, in the Psalms. What is the Lord is our strong tower? He's our fortress, our strong tower. What does that mean? A place of protection. Well, back in the original in the east, of course, when there's a town to protect it from the enemy, they build a huge, strong wall around the, the town. And then at the gate, there are two square rooms with very thick walls. And when the threat of the enemy comes, of course, the village people come in and go into those two rooms, one on either side of the gate. So that is what is talked about the strong tower, all right? So the trouble is we don't have strong walls around our communities. We don't have, you know, fortresses uh, so that we can hide in them when we have a bad day. So what does that mean for us? Well, again, we have to understand, figuratively speaking, there are three things that helps us to understand how we can hide in the strength of the Lord. For he is our strong tower. How do we hide ourselves in the strength of the Lord? Number one, we hide ourselves in praise and worship. 
praise and worship. Paul and Silas, as you know, in Acts 16, here they were in stocks and chains, and of course at midnight they just sang praises unto the Lord. Hallelujah. And what God do? He sent his goodness. An angel phew, set him free. Praise and worship, it releases something in the heavens. Amen. When I was pastor at New Life, there was a time period there that I went through a very bad day at night time. And um, we pastors, because we're humans, we do go through trials. We have bad days. I just want you to know that. Your pastor is just like me. He's human. He'll have a bad day every now and then. So you've got to tolerate and love him regardless. All right. So I was having a bad day, a very bad day, and it was lasting quite a while and things were happening uh, <coughs> to me. And Anyway, I also was, at the same time, I was involved with the Women's Aglow Fellowship. I was a, one of the board members, and, um, and so we, we had a special meeting in Brisbane, and a thousand women attended. And, of course, we got up there, and we had a guest speaker called Iverna Tompkins, some of your older ones may know, remember her, but she's Judge and Colonel's sister, and she has a dynamic ministry, absolutely dynamic, and, and she has a tremendous connection with God. Anyway, we were on the, um, at the backstage walking on the platform, and Iverna was in front of me, and uh, as we were walking around, she turned around and she said to me, God spoke to me about you. And I said, I'm waiting for the answer. You know, what's happening? And she just turned around and walked onto the platform <laughs> and left me, you know, high up in the air and wondering what's going on. Anyway, so she preached and dying sermon and, you know, had a big older call and prayed for everybody, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, just before she was ready to hand over the meeting, she turned around and he said... He said, God spoke to me about you this afternoon while I was in prayer. The Lord described your situation. And she said to me, you're going through a night time. And she began to describe to a thousand ladies in the room. And I didn't, you know, I didn't even share what I was going through with my kids. You don't share things what you're going through with your children. But here she is, here she is, she's broadcasting everything to all the people. And she was so accurate, spot on, you couldn't just, couldn't believe it. But at the end of it, she said to me, you need to sing in your night time. And I thought to myself, sing? I don't want to sing. When you're going through a hard time emotionally, it, it's very draining, and... You want to be alone? And, you know, there were times I tried to hide away from people. And you do these things. And I said, I don't want to sing. But she said, sing in your night time. And because she was so accurate in her prophecy, I knew God was speaking to me that I had to involve myself in praise and worship while I'm going through my trial and difficulty. So in the car, when I used to drive, I used to try to sing. It didn't sound very pretty. But, and the more I did it, the freer you become. There's something happens in the heavens when you praise and worship God. Amen. Amen. There's something released. I believe that strongly. And you, you, know, you need to involve yourself, no matter whether you're going through a difficult time or not. You need to worship the living God, and praise him. I enjoy your praise and worship here. It's beautiful. Just keep doing it. If you're having a hard time and you don't want to worship, do it. Yes. Amen? That's the, that's the best time to do it. Because that opens the door for the goodness of God to come through into your life. So, he is our strong tower. I hide myself in his strength 
when I worship him and praise him. And of course, God released me. The second thing we need to do well, for, to hide ourselves in his strength is hiding ourselves at the altar of the Lord. Second Kings chapter 19, the story of Sennacherib, king of Syria. Well, he was just about to pounce on Jerusalem, and Hezekiah, he gets a letter from the king. And I'm paraphrasing this, of course. And he said, you don't have to hide behind God because I've conquered basically all the cities around, and you're a dead man. Well, when someone tells you you're basically a dead man, you know, you're having a bad day. You know, you know, I'm coming to get you. And uh, so, what does he do? He takes this letter and he goes into the house of God and he puts it on the altar. And that's why I say to you, you know, hiding at the, at the Lord's altar, bring your situation, your situation to the Lord and put it on the altar of the Lord. And so he says, here, God, read this letter. I know you're a good God, but I'm a dead man. Can you read that? You know, I need your help. Well, God's, you know, when you, when you, when you hide and bring things to God, it gives God the opportunity then to start to work. If you don't come to the house of God and bring your medical report, bring your situation, whether it's your business or your finance or what, no matter what it is, medically speaking, it doesn't matter. You bring it here to the altar of the Lord. This is where you present it to God. And, and Darren, of course, a man of faith, he'll pray for you and, and God will do miracles in every one of your lives. So, Isaiah, God sends Isaiah and give him an encouraging word. And so, Hezekiah is encouraged, and then, of course, as you know, the story goes, the angels of the Lord come and wipe out 185,000 of his army, and then the king goes back with a tail between his legs and then <clears throat> gets assassinated back home. Well, that's a pretty good manifestation of God's goodness, isn't it? So, um, hiding yourself and bring your situation to the Lord here in the house of God. Not at home. Too many people stay at home when they have difficult circumstances and it's too hard to face. Emotionally we're drained. But that's the time when you need to come. You need to come. You need your friends around you to support you. I needed good friends like Scott who supported me. And it helped me come through the situation. The house of God, very important. The third thing, hiding in the strength of the Lord, is hiding in service. And this is one thing that we forget. Because when we go through the trial and difficulty, it's all about me. Me, me, me. I'm having a hard time. Leave me alone. I want to be on my own. That's it. That's what most people do, Christians. Okay? I'm telling the truth. Because I'm as human as you are. But we forget there are other people in need. Other people who need your service. And the best way to release the goodness of God in your life is to serve others in need while you are in need. Hello? A prime example, of course, is in the book of Ruth. Whereas Elimelech and Naomi, of course, they were in Bethlehem and things got bad there, drought, you name it, and so they chuffed off to Moab where it was abundance in food. And then, of course, the bad day started. They're having a bad day. Elimelech dies. Well, the bad day gets worse and then the two sons die. And of course, I leave the two widows, Moabite women, who are Ruth and Orpha, with Naomi. And of course, Naomi's in the situation now. She's on her own. She's got their two daughters in law. And um, she hears that there's Bethlehem, and things are going good back there, 
back home, and so she wants to go back home. So she tells her daughters-in-law, go back to your fa father's house and marry new husbands. So Wolfer goes, but Ruth says, no. I want to be your carer. I want to serve you in need because you're in need right now. You're having a hard day. You're having a bad day. I want to serve you. Even though I'm grieving for my husband, but in my grief, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to forget about myself and I'm going to minister to you. <coughs> Amen. She says, don't entreat me not to leave you. She said, yeah, go back home. That's where you belong. But she said, no. Your God will be my God. Your people shall be my people. Where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. So she served Naomi in her need of grief and loneliness in her bad day. And then God released the goodness of the Lord. And that goodness was, she got married to Boaz. Things got better. And of course, her seed came to David, King David, and then ultimately Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful? She got blessed out of her socks. Hallelujah. The goodness of God is manifested when we hide ourselves in the Lord. He is our strong tower. Amen. And that is so important, these three things in praise and worship. You involve yourself in praise and worship. Involve yourself, bring your need to the altar of the Lord in the house of God. Serve one another in need. So important. The third truth is the Lord wants your trust. This is the most important. He wants your trust. I'm sure the majority of those of us here today, we've put our faith in the Lord, we trust Him. I don't think it's a real issue, but the issue that is, can we honestly say we trust Him totally in our darkest day, where there may be suffering and pain, even death? What's your trust like when you're having a real bad day? It would have been easier for me to die when I was at my lowest point. And my wife, she would go home many times cry, wondering whether I'd be still alive next day. Thoughts come to you. It would be easier for me to die. Even demonic thoughts, and we have to handle that. I had to handle that. I was on very strong um, steroids to counteract the chemotherapy in my body. And of course, those sorts that come from that, they're very demonic, of course. And I had to deal with it. It's not easy. But I had to, all the way through, I would not surrender my faith. Never. I would never surrender my faith. When I was a young Christian, I built myself on the Word. I read the Word. I read the Word. That much, so much time I read the Word. I built a strong foundation of faith into my heart and life. And out of that, I, I lived my life. I would not surrender my faith. And even though I'm going through all this pandemonium and what I'm going through, and here I'm hanging on, trusting the Lord. Well, Job did the same. You know Job. We read about him. There was a period of nine months in his life where he had a bad, a very bad day. You know, <clears throat> first of all, of course, he receives the news that all his oxen and donkeys were stolen and his servants were killed. Well, when that happens, you're having a bad day. And then on top of that, he gets more news that, his, that the three bands of Chaldeans, Chaldeans who raided your camels and killed all the servants. Then more news came 
fire from heaven fell on all the sheep and shepherds and they were all fright. Well, when this happens, you're having a bad day. And then, of course, more news came that a big wind came and your son and daughters were having a party and, and the house blew down and they were all killed. Well, his bad days got even worse. And then it got worse again because then he was inflicted with all these sores and he was sitting on the ash heap scraping all his sores. And then his wife comes along and says, why don't you just curse God and die? Oh man, you're having a bad day when that happens. But you know, in all this, Job did not sin against the Lord. That's what the scripture says. But the biggest pain that he entreated, that he experienced, and that's found in chapter 23, and I'll paraphrase it for you. He wanted to find God, to find God so that he can consult with him, that he can put his case before him, so that he can begin to understand why, why has all this basically happened into his life? And then he says, you know, I go up to the north, but I couldn't find God. I go to the south, I couldn't find God. I went to the east and I couldn't find him. I went to the west and I couldn't find him. The biggest pain is where he did, lost the sense of the presence of Almighty God. God was hiding. That's what he's suffered the most. Then, make matters worse, he gets three friends. I mean, with friends like that, who needs enemies? Let's face it. And, of course, they accuse him of how bad a person you are and that all the sins that you've committed, this is why all this has happened to you. And, of course, you know the story, you've read it, and all the conversations that are recorded. And eventually, at the end of the book, God steps in and tells these three friends, why don't you shut up? And I want you to offer and give Job some rams and some cattle as a gift. Oh, okay. So they did. And Job will pray for you. Well, there you go. So what happened? As soon as Job gets the cattle, what does he do? He worships. He sacrifices. Because that's what he does. When he lost all his cattle, he couldn't worship anymore. That's why his bad day got worse. He lost the touch of God in his experience. And so here he is now back into sacrificing his animals and worshiping the Lord. Praise for his friends, and of course, as you know the story, the Lord blesses Job, and he sees four generations of his offspring after another 140 years. That's not bad. That's the goodness of God, isn't it? But imagine going through all of that, and the scripture says, though he slay me, yet will I, come on, trust him. He never gave up his trust. And yet even though he believed, because he heard so much from his friends, that God was responsible for all that had happened to him, and yet he can still trust him. I mean, God didn't do all those things. That was Satan. You know that. God does not do bad things. Hello. He doesn't. Satan does bad things. But here he is, partially believing all this has happened to him and God's happened to him and that's why he wanted us to, to put his case up before the Lord and can consult with him. That's why he was looking for him. He couldn't find him. Well, God bless his beginning. He's ending more than his beginning. Double fold. Hallelujah. The goodness of God was manifested in his life. Nahum says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. The goodness of God is not just a title, 
but it's an active term to reveal his blessings in our lives, in every situation, when we follow the principles of what this verse is all about. Amen? To believe that God is always good, that God doesn't do bad things, to believe that our place of refuge, our hiding in his strength, is by actively involved in praise and worship, by attending the altar of the Lord, and by serving those in need. And through it all, the Lord wants to put your trust in him. Amen. Your faith will never grow unless you have a trial. And if you want to live a trial for a free life, you'll your faith will never grow. Hallelujah. You understand? You see the manifestation of God's goodness in my life by virtue of the fact I'm standing here alive. And I thank God for that. And I thank you for your prayers that you have prayed for me. And if it wasn't for the prayers of the saints and good friends, I may be in glory today. But God is good. You're having a bad day? Well, I've had a few. I'm not sure if, if there's another one involved down the track, but I don't care. I love to worship. I love to attend God's house. I love to worship and praise him. Amen. I love to do the things that are important, as this verse says. Amen. God is good. Commit yourself to the Lord and he will guide your path. Father, I thank you for this beautiful people here today that have received your word. You know the heartache, the hurt, the pain that is in each of their lives. Some are having a bad day. Lord, I haven't spoken about it. But Lord, I ask that as they've listened to my voice today, that they'll hear the voice of the Spirit say, God is good. And he'll manifest his goodness to you because he is good. Amen.